Persecution. When you think about a study on persecution, what comes to mind? And is it even pertinent? What do you think of and why, why even spend? We're going to spend four weeks studying persecution out of the book of Acts. Why do we need to do that? Because it's coming. Who said that? Yes, I would say it's here, but it's coming in a different form, probably for us. Why, why persecution? It purifies the church. It purifies the church. We're going to get into that, probably not this week, but next week, as we get into some things that are happening in the book of Acts. It verifies what Christ said was going to It does. In fact, that's why I said this. Persecution is an intrinsic part of Christianity. Now, why can you say that? Do we want that to be the case? How many of you want to suffer? How many of us want to be persecuted? As Greg already alluded to, and as we're going to look at this, uh, this evening as we go through it, who told us that was, it was coming? Jesus. When he talked to his disciples and said, come follow me, did he hide this, uh, this fact? He told them from the very beginning, persecution will come, and if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. So persecution is a big part of what we're going to see. We're going to observe it in the early church. Turn to Acts chapter 4. Our study this evening is going to be entirely, well, not entirely, but it's going to stem from Acts chapter 4. Would somebody read for us Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12? It'll get us a little bit of a background on where we are and where we're headed. Jeannie, if you don't mind reading that for us, we'll allow Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple... And the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Sophias, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people, people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to the helpless man, by what means he has been made well? Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Okay, as we get into this, we're going to observe in Acts chapter 4 the beginning of the persecution of the church. Up until this time, Jesus and his disciples were persecuted, but the church as an organization is going to start suffering persecution in Acts chapter 4. When does it finish? Never. I wouldn't say never. Well, when the Lord returns. Return. Until the time of the Lord's return. Until the time of Revelation chapter 19. The church is going to be, until the time of the rapture, I guess we could say. But the church and the devil and the world system is going to be after anything that is pushing Jesus Christ and pushing the gospel of salvation. So we see this persecution begin. Was the persecution a good thing or a bad thing for the early church? It turned out to be a good thing. Was the early church looking, and we're going to talk about this piece of it a little bit more next week, but was the church, and in particular some of the disciples, were they looking forward to the persecution that was coming? <laughs> we're going to talk about Peter next week, and Peter's got a lot to say. The interesting thing about Peter is when Peter was told the manner in which he was going to die, was Peter happy about it? No, what did Peter do? 
He not only questioned, he said, but what about John? You know, is he going to at least have to suffer like I got to suffer? He wanted companionship in his suffering as he was going through the suffering. But the church in the early church from day, almost day one. Now, not from day one. And we're going to see an interesting thing as we look through that, as we back up a little bit into chapter two and three and get a running start this, uh, this evening. But from the beginning of the church in chapter four, right up until the church is raptured for nearly 2,000 years, persecution has been what the church has been going through. Now, persecution, is persecution today in the United States of America? Let me put it that way. We're going to be self-focused for a minute, but then we're going to broaden out from there. In the United States of America, is persecution today what the early church suffered in persecution? What's the difference? And you're right. That wasn't a trick question. What's the difference between what the church in the early days of the church suffered and up until now what we've suffered as Christians in America? Is the church persecuted in America today? What's the difference between that? Depends on the church. We'll talk about that too, but later. Okay, how many people in the United States of America are giving up their lives right now for their faith? Could that day come? We need to consider that. That's part of why we're going to do this series. What else? We're very few, and I don't know many people who are really imprisoned for their faith. Maybe for their faith in something else. And we're going to talk about that too as we go through, but not for their faith. Yeah, Mary. Yeah, we're not being thrown to lions. We're not being burned at the stadiums, at the football stadiums, in order to provide light at the end of the day. We're not sacrificing our lives. So how can we say as the modern church of America that we're persecuted today? We're uh, persecuted as much as we are censored. Okay, censored. That's a, that's a form of persecution. Same thing. We're really censored, and it's getting worse. And it's getting worse. Is that it? The church is being held alive. Expound on that a little bit. Well, uh, morality, acceptance of, of sin. Tolerance. Tolerance. We're going to talk, uh, we'll, and we'll save that, because we're going to talk about that in a minute, because it's an interesting thing. Look over, in fact, look over now. Look over to Acts chapter 2. I should have brought my reading glasses up here. Uh, Acts chapter 2. And somebody read verse 47 for me, because Acts chapter 2, just to give you the background again, it's the story of Pentecost. Peter preaches. Thousands of people come to Christ again. Things are really moving in the right direction for the church. And when we get to chapter 2, verse 47, can somebody read that for me? Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. What was the relationship in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, between the church and the unsaved Jewish nation around them. What did Luke say about it in that verse? They had favor. They had favor with the community. What happens between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4? Persecution is going to begin. And the question becomes, why? What's going on? What's causing this persecution? And as we look at the church today... And the way the church is persecuted today, it's very much more subtle than the persecution in the New Testament. Did people realize what was going on in the church when the church was persecuted in the New Testament times in that first century of the church? It was easy to see somebody dragged out of their home and dragged away. Okay, your friends could be the ones in the Colosseum tomorrow. Okay, so it was very upfront. Is Satan working quite the same overt way in persecution or does he do something a little more subtle in the church today and that goes to the kind of the comment that somebody made just a minute ago some churches aren't being persecuted there's a reason for that you know how is satan persecuting and attacking the church today he attacks them on the basis of what the basis is the same truth, truth. what's going to get john in trouble in john chapter four or in acts chapter four the truth When John stands up before the Sanhedrin and says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name given under heaven, whereby men must be saved, he's referencing who? And he makes it very clear if you read the verses before that. How's that going to go over with the Sanhedrin? 
Okay, so the persecution is coming because of truth. Now, how has Satan used persecution in the church today to attack that truth? In John's day, what were John, what were John and Peter told at the end of the day? Stop teaching. When they didn't stop teaching, what happened next? Eventually, we're going to read in a couple of weeks as we're going through this, James is going to give his life because they're still teaching the truth. There was a price to be paid. Now, we look at the truth today, and everybody says we're being censored. What do we mean by that? Are, are they coming in and cutting off the sound system? Sometimes our sound guys wish they were because I get too loud and I mess them up back there. But I, I saw a good movie the other day, and I was talking about how Satan doesn't care about your, whether you're moral, whether you're honest, whether you're done, blah, blah, blah. He cares about is Jesus Christ. He doesn't care you know, if you're a good person. He doesn't care if you're following any of this stuff. Yeah, it, it, a lot of good people are going to hell. I mean, what we consider good people are going to hell. And Satan's okay with that. And what he's done in his persecution, he's persecuted the truth enough that in our day and age, people are starting to get what they call canceled. Okay, if you're trying to say something that's absolute truth from this book, you are not going to be heard. Or you are put aside as some kind of a radical or hate crime type of a person and even if you remember especially during the beginning and i don't want to get into a big covid situation uh, discussion okay but bringing that up from the fact that when covid first came out and churches were still meeting churches were partially targeted the fact that they need to go back and be re-educated re-educated about what their absolute truths aren't absolute yeah bj so just throwing this out there um I had, mom and I met this lady who was uh, in Jackson Park singing praise music, but um, anyway, we got to talking. She had escaped out of satanic heaven. Her parents were Satanists. Um, and anyway, there's a whole lot of stuff that she was telling us about, but people, Christians were being killed by the coven at that time. And I also remember in Deerfield, Michigan, there started to be an influx of the Muslim population moving in. And I remember seeing a news article, and this was back in the 90s, um, about these Christians who were, they were witnessing out on the street corner, and the children from the Muslim community that were nearby were stoning them throwing stones, chairs, and things like that. So there is things like that that has been going on in the United States. And, um, but, you know, it's not a big... It's event. unusual if it happens here that way. But um, it has been, there has been things like that. And then who was the, way back, that first girl with the first big deal school shooting, mm -hmm. you know, she was killed for her Christian testimony. So there are things like that that happen. But yes, I mean, people are, I feel like people now are fearful because those things have happened. And, um, you know, that's kind of the devil's way that he is mm -hmm. infiltrating yeah. the church. In our day and age, it's not that it never happens, but it's not like it is around the world. And I wanted to make that point. Again, for those of you who may not, I don't think I really advertised at the beginning. I started this whole study based on a new booklet that just came out by uh, John MacArthur, and it's studying persecution out of Acts chapter 4 and a couple other chapters, 16 and 8. And that's what I'm using as the basis of the study. The reason I bring that up is after I read the first chapter, I read the first chapter and thought, this is he's got some great principles in here, but it's persecution of American style. And what we need to understand is the persecution from the early church still takes place around the world. There are Muslim countries where if you accept Christ, not only are you disinherited from the family, but it may cost you your life. And there's other, not just Muslim countries, there are countries like that around the world. So we got to remember, one, that America isn't the only center of Christianity around the world. Number two, if it can happen in other places around the world, when Satan's time is ready and God lets him loose, we're probably going to see some of the same types of persecution here. How do we handle that? How do we handle the persecution we're under? And again, I think one of the things that was stated that I thought was interesting is Satan is spiritually killing the contemporary church. And again, that's 
mostly the church here, without physically having to kill anybody in it, but by inducing a complacent, indolent, rich, and society-oriented church. There are so many churches. You've got churches where they preach a Sunday morning message, and it sounds like the woke agenda nowadays. And how did that happen? Well, because of the persecution, if you don't. If you take a stand on the truth and it gets out, you are going to be questioned and persecuted. And those are the crazy people over there. And you don't want to go to that church. That, you, we will be called a cult. And I guarantee some of your friends are probably calling the church you go to a cult if you stand on absolute truth. Because they're being taught to coexist. The bumper sticker is very real in the minds of a lot of people. And again, the fact that there is salvation, there is not salvation in any other name, is going to set us apart as we go through this. It's also going to make you a target. So we need to understand that as we go through. Here are some of the realities of persecution as we think of persecution. And number one, it ought to be expected, and we talked about that. It's not supposed to be a surprise when persecution comes. Uh, Turn to John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Somebody will read those two verses for me. And I ask you to read them because I should have brought my reading glasses up here. I'm not sure I can get through it. John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. So what did Jesus Christ tell us to expect from the world? How many of us really expect that? You expect a little disdain sometimes. You expect a roll of the eyes. You expect a shrug of the shoulder. You might expect your neighbor to go out of their way to get around you. But most of us aren't expecting to be hated. But what did Jesus Christ promise us? The world will hate you. And the reason it is found, and John's going to expound on this in a couple different passages. First John chapter 2, verse uh, 15, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world has a system, and we could go on in these verses, but it says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the world is in love with its own system. And when you come along with the truth of the gospel, what does it contradict? Everything in the world system. Okay, Satan has set up a system contrary to this book. And so Jesus Christ said, if you're going to take the truth out, people are going to hate you. To the point that Christ gave specific warnings later in John chapter 15, in verses 19 and 20. He said, if you were of the world, the world would, uh, would love you as its own. And we have to be careful as Christians. How many of you don't want to be liked? You know, I know there's a few curmudgeons every once in a while that don't want to be liked. But most of us want to be liked. The population in the United States of America today, is it primarily Christian or pagan? It's becoming more pagan every day. Is a pagan world going to love you? Again, I remember talking to some folks in my HOA, and they were, they were upset at the time because people were putting out political signs. Uh, and they were upset at the time because most of them were snowbirds that came down from the north, and they were Democratic snowbirds. And they were upset because they were putting out Republican signs. So they had a big meeting. And the meeting was about no political signs in our neighborhood. But you know what other topic was put on that? We can't have politics and we can't have religion in our neighborhood. We don't want people pushing that. How does that happen? Because people instinctively know if you have an absolute truth, it's going to contradict some of what they believe, and they don't want to hear it. And if you take it to them, how do they react? Yeah, how many times, again, you need to think of, we think of this, and if from the perspective we're coming with this, why do you give out the gospel? Somebody said, I don't, but you should. Why, why, do we, why are we supposed to give out the gospel? We want people to know the truth. We want people to know the truth. And why do we want people to know the truth? God told us to be a light. And what will this book do? What will the gospel do for people? It'll save them. So we go out with the words of salvation. How do they hit an unsaved world? As foolishness. As foolishness? And that's at the, the nice end of the spectrum. As hate speech. Why? Because this book will tell them they are 
You want to make somebody happy? Go have dinner with them or have coffee with them and look across the table and say, Hey, Joe, good to see you. You know how big a sinner you are. Where does the conversation go from there? You get stuck with the bill. You get stuck with the bill, and if he's pagan, you may get an earful of words that you don't want to remember. Why? Because they hate the truth. And Jesus Christ told us that that was going to happen. John chapter 16, verse 2. He told his disciples, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to the Lord. Now again, we look at John chapter 16 and verse 2, and sometimes we don't get the full thrust or implication of what that means. When Jesus looked at his disciples and said, they will put you out of the synagogues, what did that mean to them? They were ostracized from their entire community because they supposedly, they didn't live like it often, but they were supposed to be a theocracy. God was the one. When he gave them a king, he did it reluctantly because of the hardness of their hearts. And so to be thrown out of the synagogue was to be thrown out of their very society. You think we're going to see that as sound conservative Christians in the United States of America? They're already trying to push your ideas out of the, the mainstream as much as they can. And then Peter, Peter, who we're going to talk about next week, who didn't want any of this persecution if he didn't have to have it, Peter warns this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For to you, you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And we sang the songs intentionally this evening. We will follow When we follow Jesus Christ in his steps, according to Peter, we are following in the footsteps of what? Of truth, but it's going to lead to suffering. He says right here, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. An example of what in that verse? Of how you're supposed to suffer for the truth. Did Jesus Christ suffer for the truth? To what extent? He gave his life for the truth. What does he expect of us? How many of us are ready to give our lives for the truth? Again, living in the United States of America has made the church very soft when it comes to what do we do when the truth is rejected. But for the disciples, when they gave out the truth, for the scene that we're about to look at, and hopefully I'll get to it, I'm moving way too slow, but for the scene we're about to look at in Acts chapter 4, when Peter stands up in the midst of the Sanhedrin, and he looks and he says, and God has made him to be the chief cornerstone whom you slew. Is Peter just being bold? Peter's being bold. But he's being bold to what extent? What's on the line? His very life can be on the line because the Sanhedrin had the power through blasphemy to stone the man. And did they believe Jesus Christ was the Messiah? They just finished crucifying him. So when Peter stands up for the truth in front of the Sanhedrin here, it's a big deal. And Peter's saying, you know why I'm doing that? Because I want to walk in his steps. So it gets to the point of here, persecution in the minds of some Christians is something to be avoided. That's why churches succumb to Satan's pressure, do they not? They don't want to be ostracized in the society. How do churches find favor in the eyes of the society today? Are there churches that have favor in the eyes of our society? They're they're seeker-friendly. They compromise the truth. They teach a prosperity gospel. That's a big one. And we're going to see an interesting twist on that in this passage. Community service. And again, if you sit and listen and read, and I've read probably too much now. I quit reading some of it. But the latest books out on how to resurrect and rebuild your church in tough times, you know what they talk about? Community social service. Now, it's not bad to love people. It's not bad to help people. But some of you are going to look at me funny, but I'll let you do that. Is it the mission of the church to provide community service? It's the mission of the church to service the community with the gospel. And there's a difference. Now, going along the way, it doesn't mean we can't help people. But when the focus is helping people, especially helping people so that the community that does not love the truth loves what we're doing, something's wrong. 
And so that's what's happening. I'm not taking any questions for a while, Gary. You're going to have to hold them. Otherwise, I'm not getting through. Uh, Something's wrong with what we're doing. I'll give you a chance to answer some questions in just a minute. But avoiding persecution, that's one way we do it through community service. And Paul cautioned Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How dogmatic is that statement? How many people are going to be persecuted? All, all who do what? Live godly lives. So the question is, are you being persecuted today? And if you're not, why not? And again, part of it is the persecution of Satan has led a lot of Christians to water down the truth, to change the gospel message, to soften the gospel message so that it won't be an offense. Why is Peter about to get in trouble with the Sanhedrin? When Peter looked at the Sanhedrin and said, God sent his Messiah and you crucified him, was that offensive? He probably couldn't have said much more offensive except what he said next. And the cornerstone which you rejected, God has put back in place as the chief cornerstone. Because Peter looked and said, you know what the most important thing is? Not your reaction. Not whether you love me or not. And Peter liked to be liked. Why did Peter deny Jesus Christ three times? He didn't want to be set aside as one of those weird people. Read it again. A servant girl. Who cares what a servant girl thinks? Peter did. And we can be that way if we're not. And Satan uses that. So, again, Paul reminds Timothy. Why would Paul remind Timothy of that? Timothy's a young man in the ministry. You know what young men, and to be honest, old men in the ministry want? I want people to love them. And Paul's looking and saying, Timothy, look at my example. Were there people who loved Paul? Who loved the Apostle Paul? Okay, physically on the earth when Paul was doing his ministry, who loved the Apostle Paul? The people in the church. The people who loved the truth loved the Apostle Paul, and that's okay. But the people who didn't love the truth, did they love the Apostle Paul? The wonderful thing for the Apostle Paul is he never had to make reservations when he went into a town. He just took his stuff and dropped it off at the footstep of the local jail because he was coming there soon. Because people didn't love his message if they didn't love the Lord. And we need to understand that's exactly what Paul's telling Timothy. That's exactly what Jesus told his disciples. And that's what he told us. And as we go into this idea of studying persecution and how we need to react in the face of persecution, how to handle persecution, we need to realize Jesus Christ said, it's coming. And your feelings aren't foremost in what's happening here. When people don't like you, does it ever hurt your feelings? you're going to stand for the truth your feelings are going to get hurt and jesus is trying to warn his disciples his disciples are trying to warn christians and warn their disciples as in timothy that it's important as you go through the situation christ said it would come but and taking gary's answer that, that that's your basic sunday school answer by the way if you don't know the answer you just say jesus and it almost always works somehow but it does work at this point whose love do we want We want the Lord Jesus to look at us one day and say, well done, now good and faithful servant. If he's going to say that, I guarantee you, most of your unsaved neighbors are not. And we need to get our minds around that as we go. So a couple of questions as we get here. And now you can ask your questions or answer some things. Have Satan's techniques for persecuting the church changed over time? Be careful with this one. I put this in here because the book I was reading said that flat out. Satan's techniques for persecuting the church have changed over time. Have they? Think about the American church. Satan has kind of integrated, infiltrated the American church, watered down the gospel so that they were societally accepted. Do we know any churches in the seven churches in the book of Revelation who were accused of that? Laodicea, for example. Sometimes we think, well, this is something new he's doing for the United States of America. It's not. Satan's been using these same tactics. Were there other churches where people were losing their head over the gospel? Yeah, read those letters to the seven churches. So he uses all kinds of tactics, but none of them have changed over time. Secondly, how does Satan use differing techniques to persecute the church? What does he use to persecute the church here and around the world? And how does he do it? He uses a lot of pastors. He's using pastors who aren't teaching the truth to water down 
Does that, did it tickle itching ears sound a little bit like Timothy? He uses governments. Who wants to be in trouble with the government? I know a couple of you do, but don't raise your hands. Okay, but most of us want to live, and we're told to live quiet and peaceable lives. And so suddenly we get pressured by the government. Is our current government in favor of Christianity? If you listen to them very carefully, it's, and it goes back, the Democratic platform has been throwing God out for years. And again, I don't want to get into politics, but if you're expecting the government to back you up as a Christian, good luck. You know, the days are coming when the government is probably going to be part of the persecution of God's people. But before I get any further into this, what we need to realize is, does God know this is coming? And I don't want to get through this whole thing on persecution. Everybody goes, wow, that was heavy. I didn't, I'm, not, I'm not feeling blessed at all. Because when I sing some of those songs about, I will sing of my Redeemer. He's here to carry me through. And I will follow because there is a day when he's going to say, follow me to paradise. And God has it all planned. And if you read the book of Revelation, again, I've said this way too many times over the last months, but how is society going to end up? Is it going to get better and better till it ushers in the coming of Christ? No, it's going to get worse. And so we're going to study over the next few weeks, and too much of this has been an introduction, but we're going to study over how do we handle this as things get worse? What is God's expectation of me? And how do I handle this in a world that's going to love me possibly less than it does even now as days go on? What do I do with that? And so all these things are going to be things we'll look at. We see here, as we look at Acts chapter uh, 4, we're going to see the confronting of unbelievers. If you live a godly life, unbelievers may be drawn to you initially. Is that true or false statement? It is true. Why are unbelievers sometimes drawn to Christians initially? They were in Acts chapter 2. Curiosity. Curiosity. They're not, why, are they, well, why are they supposed to be nice people? How are we supposed to be living? Love others, love others as you love yourself. We're supposed to be exemplifying whom? Jesus Christ. Should that be somewhat attractive to people? Why doesn't it last? John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. You think of John 3, 16 and 17, and isn't that good news? And even if you aren't a believer, and say Christ came so that you might not be condemned, is that wonderful news to you? Until you get to verse 18 and following. He then says in verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. That's wonderful news. But, and here's where it goes astray for them. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. How does that message go over in our society? If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you are condemned. Condemned to what? Eternity in hell. How does that message go over? It goes over further in this passage, and it says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light. Why are we persecuted if we're living godly lives? Because the light of Jesus Christ through our light lives shine on the wickedness of the people around us, and it does what? It displays it for them. Do you like it when people point out your bad qualities? There's something about we love to, even when we ask, no, no, don't say that. But we love to have people compliment us. You know, and I've told people before, it's bad for me when people leave the auditorium and they say, Pastor, that was a great message. Because in your flesh, when people tell you how wonderful you are, you start to believe it. But when people walk out the door, they can really put you back in your place. I I had a visitor not long ago. I don't think any of you heard him, so I'm going to go ahead and use this. A visitor walked out, and and I had struggled with a passage, and I thought, oh, I, I did the best I could with that passage. And several people walked out and complimented the message. And then this visitor looked, and he looked at, he opened his Bible, and said, he didn't finish, you didn't finish exegeting that passage very well, and he walked off. Now, how do you think that left the pastor whose head was starting to swell feel? I mean, you could feel the air going out of the head. But that's what's happening in John chapter 3. And that's why persecution comes, because people look and say, Jesus Christ loves the world. And when you, if you tell them that we're all God's children and we're all going to be saved, they're okay with that message. 
If you tell them that they can come to God any way they want and they'll be okay, they're okay with that message. But when you tell them that whoever believes in the Son is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, where does that put them today? Under condemnation. Do people want to be under condemnation? So who do they lash out at? They lash out at the messenger. You ever, you ever say, don't kill the messenger? You know, don't shoot the messenger? That's part of what persecution is. And Jesus Christ said, but the one who gave them the message was hated first. So realize it. He finishes off this passage by saying, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So there's a difference. There's light and there's darkness. And if you're bringing the light, those who are in darkness aren't going to love you. And you need to get your minds right. We kind of know that, but we don't expect it. We don't want it. You know, how many of us don't pass out tracks much anymore because we just don't like the reaction when somebody realizes what it is? And, and I know there's different philosophies on this, so this is a preference. And I'll tell you that before I start. But I prefer tracks that right up front on the, on the front of the track tell you this has got something to do with your eternal destiny in the gospel. The reason I prefer that is I think that's the most important message there is. I don't think you trick people into the gospel. Uh, I'm not a big fan. And as a teenager, they took me out doing this, and I felt funny about it then, and I would never do it here. But we gave out surveys. And we were told, take these surveys out and ask people what they believe. And the purpose of the survey, the intent, I guess, was somewhat good. I didn't like the ethics of it. But the intent of the survey was to go out and talk people through what they believed, what they believed about God, what they believed about Christ, and then lead them and tell them what the gospel really said was the truth and how they didn't understand what things were. And I thought, that's okay, I guess, but I, I never remember anybody taking the survey and compiling it to find out what our neighbors believed. In fact, I don't think any of those surveys were ever used again. They were, they were, they were taught, it was just an open door to get, but it wasn't really an honest open door to get into the gospel. You know, and I don't want a cartoon on the front of my track that makes somebody think they're going to get entertained because the gospel's serious business. And again, if you've got them and you use them and somebody gets saved reading through those because the truth saves souls, that's okay. But I want to be upfront with people. But when you're upfront with people, what happens? The gospel's an offense. And I've struggled. I struggle with that. I like being liked. I don't like people not liking me. But persecution goes much further than that. And Jesus said, this is what's happening. And that's what's happening in the early church. We talked about Acts chapter 2, verse 47. They had favor with the, with the people. We look at Acts chapter 3, verse 11. And following the healing of the blind man in the temple, people were really excited about the gospel. And it's, it's that health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. If that were the truth, we'd be in business. If I could go up and down the streets and tell people, if you've got debts and you can't pay them, come to church Sunday, get right with God, and he's going to pay off your debts, and you'll be fine. In fact, you will be rich, you will be healthy. If, you, I, if I could go to Pardee and walk up and down the hallways and tell people, if you just come to church on Sunday and get right with God, you won't be sick anymore, I could fill the church. But the truth of the matter is that's not how it works. And what happens here in Acts is people find out, oh, this Christianity isn't exactly what we thought it was. You know, Acts chapter 2, thousands of people come to Christ. They're all friendly. They're all loving. Everything's going great. We love the church. Acts chapter 3, there, there, there's a man who's crippled and peter looks down and says silver and gold have i none that should tell you a little bit about the prosperity gospel right there one of the 12 he said i don't have any of that stuff but what i do have i give you and then what did he say did peter look down and say get up and walk in the name of jesus christ this is the start of the road down persecution if he had said in the name of jehovah get up and walk would peter have had a problem with the sanhedrin no they'd have been impressed they looked at Peter like he was some kind of prophet. But what was Peter's mission? Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. To teach and preach the gospel. And so Peter looks down and says, In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And everybody's excited still. You, you find the people following him. They follow him where? Where, where does he heal that, that crippled man? Right on the steps up to the temple. So Peter's doing something right on the steps of the temple in the name of? Jesus Christ, the person that the rulers who reside in that temple, just crucified. And a whole group comes to him to see him. And if Peter had preached the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel in Acts chapter 3, Peter would have been a popular guy in Israel. The church could have been out from under persecution. But what does Peter preach? 
Preach the truth. And what does he preach specifically? If you want to come to Christ, you have to? You've got to repent and believe. You're sinners. You need to repent. You need to put your faith and trust in that finished work of Christ on Calvary, who, by the way, you all are the ones who sent him there. That's the beginning or the end for the acceptance of the church in Jerusalem. Not only that, though, was it the, be- was it the beginning of the end for the church? It was the beginning of the end for their social popularity. But what happens in chapter 4, verse 4? Take a look at chapter 4, verse 4. Peter preaches this tough message. It wasn't tickling anybody's ears. And what happens in chapter 4 and verse 4? Five. Can you imagine? I dream about that. Well, I don't have 5,000 people show up. What happened if 100 people got saved? I wouldn't know what to do with myself. And Peter preaches this difficult message to these Jewish people who were guilty. And they turned, and over 5,000 men and women and children on top of that got saved. Can you imagine the excitement in the church? And in the midst of all that, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, what's going to happen? You're converted unbelievers. Persecutions manifest. What we see real quickly in verse 1. And as they spoke to the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Isn't that a nice way of putting it? What are these people doing? Yeah, they're grabbing them to arrest them. Okay, that's what's happening here. So you have this arrest initiated by the people who are in charge. Then secondly, not only that, but there's, they're annoyed and they're threatened. Look at verse 2. Greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Again, what is the name that gets Peter and John in trouble? Jesus. What are we supposed to proclaim? What do we sometimes shy away from proclaiming? You, you ever, and I've been guilty, okay, so I'm going to say this, and you can, if, you, if it upsets you, I'm sorry, but I've been there too. You ever talk to somebody and you're a little bit reticent to Christ, quite share Christ with them yet because you didn't know what they were going to say, so instead you invite them to church? Is it a bad thing to invite people to church? I love it when you invite people to church. I tell you what I'm going to try to give them when they're at church. I'm going to try to give them this message. But isn't it easier to say, hey, you need to come visit my church. Then can I tell you about Jesus Christ? Because most people aren't offended if you invite them someplace. They'll tell you no and they feel okay about it. Or maybe they'll tell you yes and come. But if you tell them, can I share with you Jesus Christ? He's changed my life and he's what you need. Do you get the same reaction as when you come to church? And I look at this and I look at Peter and the reason that Peter and John annoyed the people was because they proclaimed Jesus Christ. And that's where the power is. Why are these, why are these folks, why would the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees be threatened? Yeah, they tell you, not only is there thunder being taken away, but the power is in Jesus Christ. And who wants the power? They did. And so here they're threatened, they're annoyed. And then we get to verse 3. The apostles are imprisoned. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. How many of you have missed that reading through this? As I was thinking about the persecution, I kept thinking about the rest of chapter 4, where they're going to be in front of the Sadducees, and they're going to be told not to to share the truth anymore. But it started with a night in prison already. How many of you want to spend a night in prison? I don't know where they put them. Whatever prison they had that they used, they put them there, and they put them there overnight. It's just one night. How many would you like to just spend one night in prison for your Christianity? There's one. I, I'm not sure I could put my hand up. I like my freedom. And again, as Americans, we really like our freedom. And so when we look at how am I going to handle persecution, what if it costs you your freedom? John and Peter weren't planning on spending the evening in prison, but there they were. And so they're arrested. They spend a night in prison. And then we see that God works in spite of what those who are persecuting them did. And the thing we need to look at is we're going to go through in the next couple of weeks, and please come back. A lot of this was introduction to some exciting things we're going to look at in Acts. But we look at this situation in Acts, and we find out even though the church is being persecuted and God's message is, be, is trying to be squelched, it still goes forth and it works. It's after verses 1, 2, and 3. After they're arrested, after they're 
annoying and threatening the leaders that are there. After they're put in prison for the evening, then we get the message of verse 4, which is what? The results of Peter's preaching that got him there. 5,000 people were saved. And again, why is persecution such a potent weapon for Satan? Because if he can intimidate you through persecution to keep your mouth closed about Jesus Christ, he wins that battle. Excuse me for saying it, but I think sometimes Satan wins the battle when we've only invited somebody to church and we stop there. As I read this, and we're not going to get there today, but we'll get there next week, I'm just so impressed with the boldness of Peter. And we can look at it very, very quickly, but when you see Peter, starting in verse 5, if I can read it, I'm going to read it for a minute. It says here that on the next day, the rulers and the elders and the scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Caiaphas the high priest, or with Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander. And these were all men that were powerful men in their day. And they're all sitting around, and they're listed because they are powerful religious figures. These are the people who have the authority to call for a stoning if they feel like they're being blasphemous. And in the midst of all that, it says that, and they, they set them there in the midst. And again, the idea is, if you look at where, I think it was called the Hall of Hewn Stones, if I'm not mistaken, but that's where the Sanhedrin would meet. And they would sit in a semicircle on these steps made out of these hewn stones. And the president, the, the chief the, the high priest would sit on the other side looking at those men and, and talking to those men. And when somebody was accused, they were stuck right between the high priest and that semicircle in a place of intimidation. Every authority and power was sitting there, and they were surrounded by the authority and power. And that's where they put John and Peter. Is Peter bashful because of that? Now, now remember who Peter is in the flesh. It, was there a time when Peter might have denied Christ to get out of the middle of that circle? But that Peter's not the same Peter anymore. That Peter standing in the midst of that circle has been indwelt by the Spirit of God. That Peter has sat with the Lord on the side of the seashore and said, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. That Peter is going to give us some of the most potent principles on how to handle persecution in the book of 1 Peter. And suffering when it comes. And that Peter stands up in the midst of all that and says in verse, beginning in verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being ex- examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? He starts and says, If this is why we're here, because we healed the crippled man, but he doesn't stop there. He says, Please come to church and I'll let you know how it's supposed to come out. He doesn't say that, does he? Look what he says. It says here, And a crippled man, by the means that he'd been healed, verse 10, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. What does Peter do? Peter boldly proclaims what? Jesus Christ. The truth about Jesus Christ. And that's where we need to be. Now, is that going to get Peter off the hook? Is Jesus Christ going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. There's no suffering left for you. There's no persecution left for you. Where's Peter still headed? What's Peter's end going to be? The cross. Did Peter know that? He knew that before the day of Pentecost. Jesus Christ told him. The interesting thing is, did Peter try to get out of that? You never see Peter trying to talk to Jesus Christ. Now, he wanted to know if John could come with him. Okay? He didn't want to go by himself. But he never tries to talk Jesus Christ out of it. He never tries to rearrange things. And the biggest thing I get from Peter is Peter speaks boldly of Jesus Christ, and he never, ever waters down the truth because he's going to be faithful to that mission until God calls him home. Peter was going to give his life when he followed in the steps of Jesus Christ. We'll take a lot more time to discuss this next week, but probably a good place to stand there. What are you willing to give to proclaim Jesus Christ? Maybe the better question is, what is it that keeps you at times from proclaiming Jesus Christ? Next time you have an opportunity and you don't, take the time to think about why. It was a painful activity. I was challenged as I was reading through this this week, and I started thinking back to the last time I didn't proclaim Christ when I probably should have and had to ask myself why. And every reason 
as the things we talked about, I wanted people to like me. I didn't want to be offensive. The gospel's an offense. It didn't want to set people off. But the truth of the matter is, didn't love people enough to give them the only message that would bring them to eternal life. Now, they may not love me. They may not love the message. But once I've given that message out, then it's the job of the Holy Spirit of God to convict, to draw, to bring them to Christ. But for whatever reason, as God set that up, he didn't set it up for angels. He didn't set a huge announcement that he made from the sky. He gave us the message of the gospel to give it out so that he could do works in hearts. Are we willing to pay the price to stand for Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we have opportunity to look deeper into these passages in the next couple of weeks, that you'll give us a wonderful time of reflection, of discussion, of asking questions and bringing commentary over the passage. But I pray that you'll use this introduction as an opportunity to, to get a hold of our hearts. Lord, are we truly willing to be testimonies of Jesus Christ? Too often we're content to be good church members and Christian people, and love the truth when we're amongst Christian people, but shy away a little bit of sharing the truth when we're not in the midst of folks who love you and the truth. God, I pray that you'll give us boldness, that by the Spirit of God you'd give us the words to say. And Lord, not that you'd make us cantankerous or looking for issues or trying to rub people the wrong way, but Lord, help us to love people enough to give them the truth of Jesus Christ. Use us to be testimonies. Use us to be light. And Lord, help us to be willing to pay the price if the price comes for shining for Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.